So anyway, what are we here for? We're going to talk about me? I don't know. Uh, I've already done that, so what, what is it? Well, it's a course on sound business literature. Uh, one thing you can talk about if you want to, you can read a little bit if you want. Sure. And uh, uh, for the class, it might be helpful if you tell them a little bit about the South Texas writers that you read that helped you write the book out of Oh, okay. The influences that you. Uh, um, I, um, I had read a few people uh, before, you know, that's kind of ironic too. Uh, again, when I was c coming to school in America, uh, I'd ask for a reading list or I'd ask for, you know, uh, something for my, for my teachers and they'd tell, you know, you better concentrate on reading one ads because you're going to need a job after high school right away, right? So, um, so it didn't really get much instruction on, on that level. Hey, uh, didn't really get much instruction on that level, but when I was living down in Querétaro, Mexico, I ran into a, um, a, another a, an English professor down there who was down there teaching uh, ESL, and he had just finished up his master's, and he gave me pretty much all of his library, uh, the things that he wasn't uh, reading anymore, right? And in there, I remember there was some Jonathan Swift. I read I read Gulliver's Travels. I read uh, Walden. I read Thoreau. Uh, Truman Capote got in there somewhere or another with in, in Kublai. And at the time, I was really, really starved for the English language because living in central Mexico, I had like about three or four channels. And what would I get on those channels would be like old reruns of, uh, of, of what was the Beverly Hills 90210, something like that? Yeah. And um, <laughs> Jump Street. What is it? Hollywood Jump Street? 21, 21 Jump Street. Jump Street. Jump Street. With Johnny Depp, which was, who, who, you know. Um, Fumble. Huh? He plays Fumble. He plays Fumble on, on, on The Lone Ranger now. But I always liked Johnny Depp. And uh, he and I are the same age, so I think that, that uh, we used to play together as kids or something like that. But I always, I, I always liked him. And um, but th there were all those shows, and he, um, they all had the same voice. They were all dubbed in Spanish with the same voice. So whoever was talking, you know, what, what Dylan sounded just like, you know, Johnny Depp on Twenty One Jump Street, and even the girls, they, you know, they had like masculine sounding voice. I was Dylan, you know, stuff like that. And I was just, just. You know, driving me crazy. And the bad thing is that uh, you know they'd show cartoons and stuff like that. And I've, I've always been a big fan of Saturday morning cartoons. And I knew they were getting the damn translation wrong. You know, I said, Fred from the did not say that, damn it. You know, you know? And it, it, it bugged the hell out of me. So, like I said, I was really starved for the English language. And this guy gave me his uh, his, his library, and I started reading that and. Um, uh, and you know, I just I just read something every night, every night, every night, every night. I'd, I'd read something, and then when I uh, um, I didn't know that that was like the reading list for a master's course, right? And then when I got here to the valley, I started uh, um, you know bouncing around. Uh, um, like I said, I didn't know what a GPA was. I didn't know what a um, um, financial aid was, grants, scholarships. I remember I got a letter from STC telling me, that informing me that I that I should go to the school, report to H building, I believe it was, uh, because I had made the dean's list. I'm like, fuck, <laughs> what I do? Why? You know, and, and, I, and I'm you know going through everything, and, and I knew that I'd been you know uh, pretty outspoken in class and stuff like that. Uh, and you know, I figured, you know, then, then there was one time when the when the teacher said, uh, "There's an interesting aroma of like uh, a scented watermelon and pot." Uh, kind of <laughs> and I remember turning to some guys next to me, going, "You guys taking them way till after school?" <laughs> Knowing full well that the cloud was, you know, uh, uh, hovering over me. So I figured it was something like that, right? They caught me getting high, or they're gonna make me pee in a cup, or, or you know, I said something in class. And, no, 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 no. They gave me a pin and a little velvet uh, carrying case and a donut. <laughs> and she and, 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 and she and she, she told me something that I had seldom heard, heard before. She said, "I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you." And that uh, I seldom heard, heard it, you know, ever spoken in my family, and never heard it uh, spoken from a white person. And it might not seem like a whole lot to you guys, but it did. It, it, it really did mean a lot. And and it, you know, it's one of the things that I. Uh, uh, I, and, and you know, if I ever get the chance, I'm, I'm going to thank this lady. She is my boss now. She signs my checks. Um, 
But that that was a, a, a big milestone in my academic career. And I said, wow, so all you gotta do is, it, it, I figured everybody got A's, <laughs> right? I didn't know that there was any kind of special distinction. I, I didn't, I figured, they tell you what to do, you do the work, you turn it in. There's, you either get an A or you get an F. There's no in-betweens, right? You're either doing it right or you're doing it wrong. So I, I didn't understand anything that there was honors or, or you know, a high GPA or, you know, Puma or Magna or anything like that. Again, that's how in the dark we were uh, coming over here. So I'm starting to learn a little bit, and, and now I'm, they're telling me I have to switch from STC to Pan Am, right? And when I get here to Pan Am, I remember I was taking a class with was it Michael Reed. Is that his name? Sure. Michael Reed. Yeah, Mike Reed. And Mike Reed was telling us about how he um, he'd been doing, and it was a thirteen oh one class or a, 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 a rhetoric class or something like that. You know, freshman writing. And now, in retrospect, I understand why he why he was telling us this. Right? He, he was he was uh, reading us the riot act and telling us basically, you know. Whatever you, you know, any of you out there who think you know how to write, you don't, right? So you all suck. If I'm telling you it's wrong, it's because it's wrong. And it's pretty much kind of like the same speech I give my, my students when, when we start off the semester. But he did a little bit different. He said in his 25 years of teaching, and I guess back at that time it was 25 years, right? It's probably like 45 now. He, um, he said that uh, he'd only met one person who could actually write. And uh, he said, and you could tell, you know, just by reading any of their work. And then he starts telling us a story about a um, one of his uh, students who who told him that her father had told her that if uh, he ever caught her talking to a a, a white guy, uh, he would chop off all her hair, right? And I went home and I told my wife about this, right? I told her, hey, check this out. This guy's been teaching for 25 years. He hasn't been able to find anybody who can write. And that seemed really funny to me. And then I told her the story about uh, the girl getting her hair chopped off if, if she talked to a white guy. And my wife, uh, who's just a, a genius in her own right, said, I'm surprised he didn't tell her he was going to chop off her tits, right? <laughs> the, the, the father was. And yeah, that would have been something my dad would have said or something like that. Ironically enough, my, uh, my nephews are, are, are half white. But my only sister um, had kids with a white guy and still has her boobs. So I guess it was, <laughs> it was just a hollow threat. But, uh, uh, but that was it. So I, I sat down and I wrote that story and I gave it to, to Mike Reed. And, um, and Mike Reed wrote on it, um, now I can say I have two writers in 25 years, which I'm sure was all bullshit at the time because I go back and I look at that story and I'm like, oh man, that was a bad story. But he got me in contact with Rob. Um, that he said, you know, we, we get creative writing over here, and, and you know, you need to you need to talk to Rob, all right, uh, Rob Johnson, um, and and uh, and I guess he must have said something to Rob. And one day we kind of like ran into each other, and like, are, are, are you Juan Joe? Yeah. Are you Rob Johnson? Yeah. And, and we started we started getting to talking, and he uh, told me to sign up for his class, his creative writing class, and, and I did. And I submitted my story, and he says, you know, because it, it's always hard to get somebody to go first, right? So, uh, so I did, and I figured, you know, the heavens were going to open up, and everybody's going to come sing their praises and stuff like that. They told me, you asshole, on that story, and <laughs> rightly so. I mean, it, 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 it did suck, but I did. I guess I did show some hints of a promise there, right? I mean, you won the Gallery Award. I think that was a later story, uh, though. The yeah, story? yeah. But the thing, the thing that I did realize is that all I needed to do was that, um, was what Mike Reed originally told me. He said, you know, you have talent, but you, you lack instruction. And yeah, uh, once I started taking the hints, and, and uh, I found that um, my writing became much more streamlined. That that, that I was able to you know, develop a voice. Uh, that I was getting better and better at it. But as far as uh, who influenced me? Well, uh, Rob's reading list did a lot for me. He started giving us books. Uh, um, um, well, David Mantojano, right? That was the first like the Mexican militant book that, that I got my hands on, and I liked that. And then I, you know, started reading a little bit of Gloria Sandoval. And and what he did was he took us away from the norm of the San Cisneros and the Denise Chavez's and stuff like that. And, uh, and we started looking at, at, at other things. And one of those, uh, Rob was uh, um, starting to do his research on William S. Burroughs at the time. So he gives us Junkie and Queer and Naked Lunch and uh, I, you know, all the rest of them, right? Uh, uh, something like that. And well, I, you know, I, I read Junkie, 
Then I read On the Road, and I read Ginsburg's poems, and I read the Portable Beat uh, anthology, and I, uh, um, the, the, a little bit of, uh, um, what's this guy, Miller from the Crop of Cancer? Henry, Henry Miller, yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Williamson would always try to you know, cram that one down um, um, my throat, and, and you know, and I kept on looking at these guys, and and and, uh, and I was like, "Well, you what? What? You know, these guys sprinkle a, a, a few fucks and pussies around here, and and all of a sudden, you know, it's you know, it's, you know groundbreaking, and it's raw, and it's brutal, and it's like, oh shit, yeah." And I and, and especially junkie, I, you know, and I, and I like Burroughs. I like his style. I I I, I thought he, he painted a, a a pretty accurate picture. But it was always a picture from from the the consumer side of, of, of drug dealing. It was always and and from a white consumer side of, of, of drug dealing. And and you know, um, I always found that hilarious, right? That that was always real funny to me because you know, first of all, I can't believe what white people pay for drugs. It's just it just blows my mind. They should be locked up for that. I mean, really, that should be the crime right there. You pay how much for an eighth of an ounce? Are you crazy? You get over the for that shit. 